Hey, oh, Omni Dogs and Omni Kittens. It's Omni Dog from Omni Dogs Vault. And I am here with my co host, Taylor Brown. Taylor, how's it going? It's going really well. And I'm really excited to combine two of our favorite things crime and superhero comics. That's right. This is an episode that we like to call Crime Corner. And this is part one of super, our favorite superhero crime comics. That's right. Right? Right. Yeah. And so this is a series that we'll return to throughout the year. So this is part one of this segment. And then in January, we'll just review regular, some regular crime books. And then I think in February, we have a special guest from the Omnibus Collectors Group who will join us to talk about Bendis and Brubaker's Daredevil runs. Because Jess hasn't read those yet. I have not. And those are excellent runs. And I'm so envious that you get to read those for the first time because they are unbelievably great. Bendis's Daredevil run might be my top three runs of all time. Runs of comic books in yeah. general? Yes. Ooh, that's a big statement. I love it. And Brubaker's run is really up there. I think they're both so tied together. Yeah. Because Bendis's run ends on a cliffhanger, and Brubaker picks it up and runs with it. So, oh, nice. But, Bendis, but Brubaker's run, I'm sorry, Brubaker's run has my favorite single story arc of Daredevil ever. So hopefully that'll whet your appetite to read those in January. Okay. So I'm, I'm excited for that second episode. reading them in January for February. Right, right. Because right. that's, that's four Omnis you have to read, so you have to have a good lead-in. Right. I can I can do it in January. And I think in January we'll be reviewing Fuse and Hadrian's Wall. Good. Because you have been hyping up Hadrian's Wall really hard, and I have it in one of my recent orders on the floor. So oh, I have to read it. I uh, Temper your expectations. I haven't been hyping it up that I just thought it was really, really good. I think after Matador, you're trying to soft pedal. On the <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> the bar I've set is like on the ground. You just have to step over it. I don't, I mean, it's really low. I think this is our 15th overall episode of different shows that we've done. And we've only had one book we've disagreed on. So that's pretty good. I think, I think overall our tastes align, but the Matador, the Venn diagram didn't line up there. <laughs> Venn diagram. It wasn't in the cards for us there. Well, that's so okay. We'll return to this segment throughout Crime Corner. The next time will be in February, but whenever Jess and I read a superhero book that has a crime bent, we'll we'll come back and talk about it. But we're going to steer clear of Gotham Central, which is the best superhero crime book, because we'll talk about that eventually in our other show, Batter Days in the Batcave. So please right. know that we love Gotham Central. That is the epitome of superhero crime, but we're going to save that for Batter Days. Yeah, I do love that book. And if if we're going to do a review of that book, you're going to need to give me a solid six months to <laughs> read it again <laughs> because it took me six months yeah. to read it just in general. I just know we'll, we'll read it eventually for Batter Days. We have yeah. to. I'll reread it again for like the second time, second or third time. I can't remember how many times I've read it. But it's excellent. Yeah, it is brilliant. Um, so we're going to talk about, we want to start with Punisher Max. Yeah. Aaron. And guys, Jess really impressed me today. He busted this book out this morning. He read the whole thing. That's 22 issues. Right on. That's how much he is dedicated to this channel. <laughs> That's right. And um, I know, I know the Punisher isn't technically a superhero, but he's part of the Marvel Universe, and this is our show, so we can do whatever we want. <laughs> I and, like it. You're getting my attitude. It's really <laughs> off on. And Garth Ennis' run is excellent, and that's like highly regarded as the best Punisher that you can read. But in my estimation, in my personal subjective opinion, this is my favorite Punisher run. And it's 22 issues, issues of just pure comic excellence. And Jay Snarin, depending on the day you ask me, he might be my favorite writer. It fluctuates between Jason Aaron and Ed Brubaker because Aaron has written some of the best crime comics that exist. Scalped, Southern, Bas Southern Bastards, Men of Wrath. He is an amazing writer. He excels at crime. I think the only person who can do crime better is Brubaker. I agree. And I I Except for Greg Rucka. Those are the three. That's like the trinity of crime writers in the comic world. Yeah. Rucka, Aaron, and Brubaker. Yeah. Baker. I think that's hard to argue against. Right. And there's a since this is Punisher Max, there's a whole lot of stuff I cannot show. But Steve Dillon's art is 
right up there with his best. I think oh, yeah. He, I think he, it is his best. I yeah, I agree. He just is flawless. It's even better than his stuff in Punisher. I think I'm sorry, Preacher. I think that uh, I felt Preacher while his artwork was good in that, it got to be a lot crisper um and is almost flawless in this. Um, I just really felt Steve Dillon was clicking on all cylinders for this whole run. And I mean, once I start, I'll highlight myself once, uh, maybe once Taylor starts talking about the book more in depth and, and show you more. Yeah, I think Dillon's art style isn't to everyone's taste, but his art perfectly lines up with the gritty and grimy world of the Punisher. I don't think his art style lines up with major superheroes like Spider-Man, Hulk, or Captain America, but he is perfectly suited for a crime epic like this book. I love his work on The Punisher, and Jess and I were just talking earlier today that it's so sad that his life was cut short mm. while he was working on his latest Punisher run with Becky Cloonan. Yeah. And the art just in the rest of the series couldn't match up to his greatness. And yet again, here's an example of a comic book creator who was taken from us far too soon. He had a lot more to offer. He was getting better and better with each year, in my opinion. I agree with that. He was just improving every year and getting better. So how about you show off some art and highlight yourself while I read the summary on the back of the book? Okay. For people who haven't read it before. Yeah, and this is Punisher Max explicit content. So this yeah, is, so this is a for your kid. Don't buy this for your son or daughter for Christmas. No. If they're, not, if they're under 18. Actually, they should probably be over 18 to read this book. <laughs> yeah. Lots of violence, lots of nudity, lots of uh language. La language, yeah. It's lots of everything that makes it's just it disturbing too. That's sorry? It's disturbing a lot of points too. Oh, it's the yeah. The bullseye <laughs> stuff, especially. We'll get to bullseye in a minute. The bullseye but. stuff is probably <laughs> the most disturbing but the most brilliant part of the book oh yeah we'll get to that in a few minutes so here's the summary on the back of the book and jess will show off some of the art well at least the art that he can show and not yeah. get and not get uh reported on youtube so the mob has set a trap for frank castle turning low-level enforcer wilson fisk into a fictional kingpin of crime for frank to target but fisk decides he quite likes his new position enough to kill his bosses to keep it Suddenly, the Punisher finds himself in a one-on-one -on -one war with a deadly threat, and he must decide how far he is willing to go to take the Kingpin down. Contending with dirty cops, battling the Kingpin's henchman Bullseye and Elektra, and suffering through a stint in prison, Frank Castle is brought lower than he ever has been. But as the Kingpin of crime will soon find out, all that means is Frank has nothing left to lose. And this has a really disturbing turn from Bullseye, which we just talked about. And in this book, he is a sociopathic super assassin who will do whatever it takes to get the job done. And I don't know about you, Jess, but I love his first scene in the book where he goes into this room of armed men buck naked and he asks to go to the bathroom and he yeah. literally craps out a plastic bag with a gun in it and then proceeds to kill everyone in the room. Yeah. And at some point, at one point in the book, he has a nail through his head, and he just he paints a bullseye on his forehead. I think this is the best rendition the character has ever seen. I think that this is the. I've never. I think the mo. Actually, I'm gonna say this. I think Bullseye is right up there with the creepiness of James Gordon Jr. Mm. Here, I think both of those characters have just disturbed me more than any other comic book villain. You know what I like. Uh, what I like to to dislike about them is um, they they are sociopathic and psychotic, um, but they're still super smart and still thinking and still deadly. They are extremely focused and and still. It's not like they're uh, on a wild crime spree, killing for killing's sake. Um, these guys are really careful. They're they're well thought out. Um, they're very cerebral. Uh, even though um, both James and Bullseye, even though they're painted as, I mean, even though they're presented as psychotic, 
I, I don't know. I don't know what parts of the brain involve sociopathic and psychotic. I don't uh, quite, quite frankly, but um, I know that the fact is these guys are still brilliantly thinking while they are maniacal murderers, and that's the scariest thing to me is that they're. Um, they're not just going out and shooting people and leaving clues all over the place. And then the police bust them and get them off the streets. Yeah. There's a method to their madness in a way. Yeah. And I think many people label the Punisher as a really uninteresting and one dimensional character. But I think this book proves that his backstory and his motivations are very complex. You know, he didn't just embark upon this one man war because his family was killed. That that spark of violence has always burned brightly within him. And he would become the Punisher regardless of if his wife and kids were murdered or not. And Garth Ennis really proves that in his run with Punisher Born. That the Punisher has always existed within Frank Castle back in the Vietnam War. And Aaron does a great job of setting up a very old Frank Castle. I think he's like in his 60s or maybe early 70s. I think he's 60, exactly. And he is just like really beat up. He's been yeah. shot a countless number of times, stabbed. It's it's unbelievable he even survived most of this book. You know what I mean? Like all the stuff that he went through throughout. Right. He get his bones broken, that he would be shot, he'd be stabbed. It's like it was it stretched the limits of believability at some point that a human being could survive this, you know, survive all these things. And so this is a very entertaining yet tragic story. And it shows you how much violence strips away your humanity. Even mm. if you're killing people who are worthy of it, you're killing bad guys, that violence just taints the soul. And it leaves a mark on you that you can't really get off. I think it really shows you the numbing effect that violence can have on a person. So I thought it was actually a really deep dive into the psyche of the Punisher. I don't want to spoil anything. But part of Bullseye's process is that he tries to get inside the mind of his prey, and he actually discovers a really deep secret of Frank's that really shocked and surprised me. Yeah, me too. About you. Yeah, but me too. I don't want to spoil it, but it was just, I never expected that to be a part of his history. And I think Jason Aaron just found a really cool backstory to the Punisher that didn't exist before. Right. I think he made him a lot more interesting. He wasn't just a killing machine, that he has a lot more layers than that. Yeah, and it wasn't just it wasn't just revenge for his family being killed in the park. There was a lot more to it that led to his becoming the Punisher. Right, because he's already he's already killed those people. So it has it's not just revenge. He's been doing this for years and years and years. He likes it. There's like a beast within him that he's constantly feeding. Right. You know, constantly trying to satisfy. Um, yeah, it's not just a revenge, not, not just a revenge book. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that not only do we learn um, uh, the layers that go into Frank Castle, but how complex and interesting the Kingpin is and Bullseye. Yes. Yeah. We've only mentioned the Kingpin. The Kingpin is very interesting in this book. And you really get a peek into his family life with his wife, Vanessa, and their son. And he is such a reprehensible character in this book. He's almost as hateful as Bullseye. They're both just gross and disgusting people. Yeah. They don't care about anybody. Right. And obviously, when they get their comeuppance at some point, it's, it's, it's very satisfying. But the, that's what's great about having um, an omnibus of 22 issues is that it gives you the room to explore the histories of Kingpin and uh, Bullseye and... Yeah. Not just the histories, but what's going on in their minds right now, what's created them, and what keeps them motivated to continue as they are. And we probably should have said this earlier, but the Punisher Max line isn't in the main Marvel continuity. This is its own separate pocket universe, and that's really important because superheroes don't exist in the Max universe. You're not going to see Spider-Man web, you know, web slinging by or Iron Man flying by. That this is a very gritty and realistic world. So this isn't a main continuity. And so there really can be ramifications. There can be deaths, which can't happen in the Marvel Universe to some degree. Let me just say that the, the deaths that happen in this book won't be retconned. I'll put it that way. Right. Which and I thought really interesting. The, There's actually consequences. Yeah, it makes them meaningful. Right. That, is, meaningful. Not, 
that's one of the things that grows tiresome of reading DC and Marvel books at times. If they're if they're in main continuity, there really aren't many ramifications, or even if they are, they're only felt for a little bit of time and then retroactively removed. So it's nice to read an Elseworlds tale within the Marvel universe because that's not really something Marvel does that much. So it's really refreshing for me. Yeah. Yeah, I 100% agree and I uh they and they did also Jason Aaron did a deep dive on uh Vietnam uh not necessarily his time in Vietnam but um what it was about him that motivated him to serve in Vietnam. Right. And how how real life affected him as opposed to the life of a soldier or right. a Marine in this case. Right. And I think we need to give a shout out to Dave Johnson who did the covers for this book. He did a phenomenal job. Yeah. I love the covers of this book and I love the design under the dust jacket. I love this image on the omnibus. Yeah. That's so cool. I think Dave Johnson's my favorite cover artist. Oh, really? Comic. I think he draws such interesting and dynamic covers. That are so do good. you know off the top of your head other series that he's done covers for? 100 Bullets. He did all those covers. Oh, okay. I'm pretty confident he did. He's okay. got, he did a lot of the covers for Greg Rucka's Detective Run, too. Okay. Very excellent. He's done a lot of different covers. And I actually still need to read Superman Red Sun because he drew that whole comic. I still haven't read that. The Mark Miller one? Yeah, is, is that good? Oh, yeah. I need to read that. I was just on my way to going to pull it out and looking at it. <laughs> the trailer for the animated movie just came out today. The animated movie for Red Sun? Yeah, and that made me realize that I need to read that book as soon as I, as soon as soon possible. So it looks really interesting. Oh, yeah, it's so good. It's, uh, it's easily one of Miller's best. Okay. Miller or Miller, however you want to say it. I'll it's definitely pick it up. Because I really enjoy most of DC's animated movies. They're not all amazing, but there are a lot of really good ones. And so I want to read that book before I watch the movie. Yeah. So unfortunately, this omnibus is out of print. It's been out of print for a number of years. So the best way to collect this, if you want to have this story, and I really think you should have this story, it gets my full resounding endorsement. And it sounds like it does for Jess as well. 100%. The best way to get it is to get the complete collection. They have, a, they have the whole Punisher Max line out in, in um, complete collections right now. Really ch chunky, thick trades. And it's volume seven, I believe, of that run. And so volumes one through four are by Garth Ennis, his Punisher Max run. Okay. I, I believe five and six are other fill-in writers. And then seven is the capstone with Jason Aaron. So oh, one complete collection covers the whole thing? Yeah, it's must, it must be a huge complete collection. I've never wow. seen it personally. But I know it's still on IST. So I think you should definitely buy this run if you haven't already. And if you really want the omnibus, I think it's kind of going for a decent price, though. I mean, not I mean, at too, I think it's going for too much, probably. Oh, you think it's too expensive? I would say it's probably going for like close to 200, maybe. Let's see. Um, okay. 100. I'm saying it's probably at least going for 150. Which okay. again, not too bad. But. It was cover. Cover was a hundred bucks. Yeah, one fifty is probably not too bad, uh, except for the fact that it's readily available uh, in complete collection. Punisher omnibus. Amazon secondary market. It's going for one ninety eight is the lowest price. And so you look at eBay though more. Yeah, I'll look at eBay and see what it is sold sold for. Uh, copy is sold from Canada for 135, 150, 150, 121. 150 is not bad for a hundred dollar book that's out of print. Yeah, it could be worse. If you, if you, I mean, if you're dying to have it in omnibus format, and if I, it me, I would just buy the collect, the complete collection. That yeah. would be fine for me personally, but I know that you have a lot of fans who are big into Omni, so yeah. it's really up to you. But I think the complete collection would be a solid route because I have those first four complete collections from Ennis, and they're great. That yeah. was where the Omnis were reprinted, so I picked those up. So definitely get in any format that you can. These aren't on Marvel Unlimited, to be clear. 
the Max books are not on Marvel Unlimited. None of them That's are. important to note. Yeah, so um, Fury Max, Punisher Max. I think they had a Deadpool Max. I never read it, but I think that's the series. None of those are on Marvel Unlimited because I don't think they're family friendly enough. <laughs> these are these, these are, are not family friendly. Not at all. Maybe if you're a mob fan, family. I don't know. <laughs> these are not family friendly. So that's a good point that they're not on Marvel Unlimited. And when I. 150 to me is if you want the book badly enough, that's not, I, I get it if somebody wants the omnibus. So I'm not going to uh, make any judgment on anybody, um, but the collected edition is a, a perfectly uh, acceptable way to read some excellent material um, also. So you, I mean, I mean, if it was a $300 book, then I would, that's a completely different, but it sounds like if you if you're careful, you can bid and get it for even like 125 on eBay. So okay. if I was dead set on the omnibus, that's probably the way I would go. And if I was more flexible, then I'd probably go the complete collection route. Yeah, I definitely get why people want this Omni. It's one of my favorite Omnis in my collection, so I can't judge anybody who wants it. But yeah. I think this complete collection again is a solid way to to have this run. Either yeah. way. And so I actually have a TV and movie recommendation for fans of this run. That's what we like to do for Crime Corner. Oh, yeah, that's we right. Film recommendations. But first, for TV recommendations, I was a big fan of the Punisher Netflix TV show with John Bernthal. He's the definitive Punisher, in my opinion, on screen. Um, there wasn't really much competition before. There's Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> and then there's some fans of Thomas Jane. And then Ray Stevenson in the Punisher Warzone. Oh, I saw that one. Yeah. I mean, just enjoy Punisher Warzone, but we'll readily admit it's not the best movie in the world. It's no, kind of a guilty not. pleasure. <laughs> it's kind of a trashy, guilty pleasure. But John Bernthal is an excellent actor who I don't think gets praised enough. And he shows up first in Daredevil season two for a solid run on that second season, which was phenomenal. He was the best part of that season. And season one was much better of the Punisher than season two, but the season two was still good, even though it wasn't as good as season one. But if you okay. enjoy this run, this TV show is violent, but it also has heart to it that you deeply care about Frank and it shows him from an emotional perspective, which not a lot of comic books do for Frank. And my film recommendation is a history of violence, which came out in 2005 and that's directed by David Cronenberg. Have you ever seen that movie, Jess? I haven't. That's the one with Viggo Mortensen. Yeah. The guy who played Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. Right. That's an excellent movie. And Viggo Mortensen in this movie, for those of you who don't know, he plays this regular everyday guy who owns a diner in a small rinky dink town. And one night these two cr criminals come in and try start causing trouble and he ends up having to kill them. And he becomes like a local hero. He's on the paper, he's on the news. And this draws the attention of some uh, mob bosses from Philadelphia and a lot of mayhem ensues and his history, his criminal history is brought to light. And you find out who he really was in a past life. And I really recommend this in addition to Punisher Max because both Punisher Max and this movie show the numbing effect mm. of violence. The violence in this movie is not glorified. It's disgusting. It's disturbing. Cronenberg really shows you how devastating violence is and how much it affects those who carry it out. So that's why I think this, mo this movie would be excellent to watch after reading Punisher Max. Now, I think that that was based on a comic book right yeah the history of violence was a graphic novel i forget who the author is but i never Here, read it Chris, wait a sec i think i, I think can, have it jess i think i can pull that right away if i can get it off my shelf yeah history of violence have you ever read that i have i read it when it first came out back in Oh my gosh, this thing only cost ten dollars back in two. Do you like it? Do you mind it? Nineteen ninety-seven by Paradox Press, which was a uh, DC imprint. Do you remember enjoying it back in the day? Yeah, I believe the movie's a lot different than the book, though. Okay, it's mean, a lot different. I could be wrong. That's just what I've heard. But if you haven't seen the movie, Jess, I think you would greatly enjoy it. It's very good. Uh, William Hurt has a really great part in the movie as a mobster and maria bellows in it too right yeah. like her. 
And William Hurt, I think, got nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in that movie. Oh, I remember correctly. He has one of those ten-minute scenes in the movie that get, get out, got him a nomination. <laughs> so he just chewed up the scenery then. Oh yeah, and also who else is in it? Oh, what's his name? Uh, Ed Harris is in it, and he's oh. really creepy in it. He's good. He's, yeah, so it has a very solid cast. Okay, well, you recommend well, it. got 500 other things to watch, so I'll slot it in there. Somewhere. Yeah, unfortunately, I've, uh, I'm have i giving you a lot of recommendations with Crown <laughs> Corner and Crime Movies. But yeah, that's my recommendation for a film to watch after Punisher Max. So we can jump into our next book, which is Incognito by Ed Brubaker. Yes. Jess and I have said this a thousand times, but we'll keep saying it. Ed Brubaker is the best crime writer in the comics medium. Yeah, I'm not even going to hedge it by saying he's my favorite. I'm going to go for it and say he's the best. Try to fight us on that one. Yeah, fight us. <laughs> he has such a solid track record, minus Deadly Genesis, which I've never read. But <laughs> he has so many excellent books, just hit after hit after hit. And to be honest, Incognito isn't my favorite Ed Brubaker, but it's still so, so good. It's a brutal and entertaining thrill ride, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, yeah, I, I, you said before we got on that there seem to be a lot of people that don't particularly care for this, that this, this seems to be a divisive book. I wouldn't say people say it's bad by any means. I think people say it's lesser Brubaker. Huh. It's kind of like a collective meh from some people. I hate that word and I hate the collective meh. <laughs> I mean, come on, people. I, Gosh, I really like this book a lot. I thought it was, um, uh, it's kind of a, a mushing together of um, what they call science villains, um, a mushing together of um, superheroes and uh, real life crime. Um, I I don't know. I I found it's really enjoyable, and and I read it. I read it yesterday and finished it today. It's, probably the third time I've read it, but it's it's spaced out enough that I'm rereading it like again for the first time. Right. But it's spaced out enough. Um, he's He's got um, the characters. The main character is Hart Zach Overkill. Zach Overkill, right. Um, I, I like it that the, that the main character is hard to like, but you still end up caring about him. And yeah. he's 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 morally ambiguous, but you still end up caring about him and what happens to him. Um, I think that's a sign of a good writer when you've got somebody that, um, I mean, this guy switches sides um, so many times you lose track of who he's what side he's playing for at, at certain times but i i found him um i found him to be uh, a very interesting um character in in the in the way that he's written the fact that he is morally reprehensible but i still care about him and want to know what happens to him and I'm sort of rooting for him, even though he's not the best person in the world. Yeah. He's an anti-hero. Yeah. In a way. And for those of you who want to know a little more about the plot, the summary on the back of the hardcover isn't that great. So let me just summarize it for you. Yeah. The book follows Zach Overkill. And he, has a, he had a twin brother named Xander. And they work for this major villain named Black Death. But Xander, his twin brother, gets gunned down, and the Black Death is captured by the SOS, which is kind of like their special ops for superheroes and supervillains in this universe. And Zack's life is pretty much over at this point, so he testifies against his former boss and enters into the witness relocation program. And at the beginning of this book, Zack is stuck at a dead-end office job that he hates, and he's forced to take these pills that suppress his superpowers. And he starts getting high to start feeling some excitement and just to feel something to help him get through this dull life. But these recreational drugs actually deactivate the pills the government is forcing him to take. So he slowly but surely gets his powers back and he starts using them to fight crime, which really leads him down a dark and dangerous road that exposes his secret past. 
and it really shows you the origins of superpowered beings in this universe, which I found fascinating. Yeah. The reason why there's superpowers in this universe is very interesting. It's very unique. It's very different than Marvel and DC and where superheroes come from. And again, very similar to Punisher Max. This is a very violent book. People get their heads punched off. People get blasted in half by X by um, ray guns. It reminds me very much of a pulpy science fiction 1940s comic book, like before the comics code was enforced. Yeah. If this doesn't get you to read it. I don't know what will. This guy getting his head literally punched off his body. If you if that interests you, definitely buy this book. <laughs> that happens a lot in this book. There's a lot of violence. For sure. This is another not safe for work book. No, as are most Ed Brubaker independent books. But okay. as usual, Sean Phillips is extraordinary in this book. He is one of my top five favorite artists. I love Sean Phillips. Him and Ed Brubaker, I think, are the best dynamic duo in comics right now. That they're they work so well together. They've just again, they've done hit after hit after hit together. And it was really cool to see them kind of break loose of the crime genre and really cut loose with the science fiction element because yeah. they really usually do realistic books like the fade out like criminal and I, the fatal was more horror and also more fantastical. It was cool to see them really just get outside the box and do some crazy stuff with superheroes things you'll never see in a Marvel or DC book. Yeah. And the way, and the, the way he, um, you were right about the origins of the superheroes, you don't see an awful lot of superheroes. You see an awful lot of super villains. I feel like right. you, you see a smattering of the superheroes, but you see a lot of what they call science villains. Yeah. And you, you're introduced into their underworld and you deal with the underworld a lot in this. And he, um, as I say, he, he flips from side to side so many times. Um, he takes an awful lot of chances and which enables us to go deep on um, kind of the, the world building aspect of it. You get to see um, what, um, what he's been stuck with in the witness protection program. But when he's, after he's, um, regained his powers and then as a criminal who's actually fighting crime you get to see what he's treated like then and then when he's asked to infiltrate um uh what's his name black oh no he's uh, yeah he's asked oh. to infiltrate the the competitor of black yeah, level, level nine level nine um and and how he goes about reestablishing connections in the underworld i thought was very fascinating how you go about um uh, getting connected in the underworld um yeah. is portrayed by the book uh I, th I thought that was fascinating just um how he went as a such a recognizable face and how as having burnt so many bridges to that world how risky it was for him to go back and try and get back into that world, it was really interesting to see the path or the tunnel that led him to get back into that life. Right. And I think the first arc of the series was by far my favorite part. That was like a 9.5 for me. While the final arc, the second arc was like an eight out of 10. I wish that Brubaker and Phillips had added on another issue to the right. second arc. So I feel like they were kind of rushing to the finale. I don't know if you felt that way. And the main villain of the second arc who we were just talking about who worked for level nine, I just didn't really fully understand his plan and the motivations behind what he was doing. I wish they'd given more page time to that specific villain. I think it was Simon Slaughter was his name. Yeah. And overall... I thought the ending was satisfying enough, even though it was a bit of a downer. <laughs> like yeah. most of Brubaker's book, it's very depressing, but it fits the overall tone of what Brubaker was going for in this book. And I've heard Brubaker say in interviews that he has no plans to go back to incognito, incognito anytime soon, but he's not opposed to it, that he's open to it. Mm. Because at the end, I don't want to spoil it, but it does leave room for other stories. And I really hope they return to this universe at some point, maybe after they're done with their current criminal book that they're doing for image i would like to see them return 
the yeah. world incognito and maybe do one final story in this universe. Now, is incognito still in print? Yes. Okay, so this is really important. So two years ago, there was a mysterious reappearance of both hardcovers of Criminal from Icon and Incognito. I guess they happened to find them in some random warehouse, a bunch right. of boxes of these books, and they put them back on IST. Unfortunately, the Criminal hardcovers are by far gone. <laughs> They've been gone for a long time. But Incognito, this hardcover is still up there. So I would definitely recommend for you to buy it with your next in-stock trades order. I don't want to start any FOMO or anything because it's been up there for a while. But there is a limited stock of these. Like there's only a certain amount they have left because they found them in a box somewhere <laughs> in a warehouse. Yeah. I don't want to start FOMO. I'm not saying it's going to go out of print anytime soon. But I just know that there's a limited stock of them available. So I, I would say I'm, be I'm guessing in a couple months it probably won't be available anymore if I had to guess. If people end up keep buying it. Well, I'm terrible at predicting, so I'm not going to even. Yeah, I'm not going to guess. I'm just trying to say I would buy it sooner rather than later. If yeah. you really want it, because the trade paperbacks are out of print. This is pretty. Well, they are. Yeah, this is the only way to collect the series right now. Oh. Except for Comixology. Okay, well, then I would definitely encourage people to go out and buy it. I don't even think it's on Hoopla because Image hasn't reprinted it. Because this is back whenever he was doing books through Marvel's Independent. The icon. icon. Label. So I don't think because Image has reprinted a lot of his books that they didn't publish, but I don't think they re, I don't think they reprinted this. Let me check on if on Hoopla. Those of you who have that app, I'm pretty sure it's not. Yeah, it's not. So pretty much your best bet is to either do Comicsology or to buy this hardcover I, off IST, which I would definitely recommend because I I don't want to speak for Jess, but my Brubaker collection is very important to me. And it would not be complete without this book. I agree. So you definitely need it in your life if you're a big Brubaker fan. I agree. And, you know, looking over at my Brubaker shelf, I realized that I have never read Scene of the Crime. <sighs> oh, okay. We're definitely doing that for Crime Corner. <laughs> okay, you know, I'll save it. I made a unilateral decision, Jess. Okay. We're reviewing Fuse, Hadrian's Wall, and Scene of the Crime in January. Excellent. Because you have to read that book. That was like okay. his first big independent book that shot him into the spotlight. Ah, okay. It's very good. Okay, good. I'm glad I said something then. All right, good. Brilliant, brilliant. And so for my TV and film recommendations for this book, if you like Incognito, you'll definitely like Amazon Prime's The Boys. I love that show. And this is speaking as someone who didn't enjoy the comic book series. I thought the comic book series was way too crude and over the top for me. I just, it was just way, I don't know. It just, did, I didn't, it didn't appeal to me. But the TV show really pulls the reins back on some of that really extreme content and finds a healthy balance. It actually allows you to really care about the characters. So if you're tired of PG 13 superhero movies that always follow the certain tropes and the plot beats, then this TV show is definitely for you. And it follows a man named Billy the Butcher and his group of the boys who hate superheroes and they want to stop them from running amok and leaving a bunch of innocent bodies in their wake. And I really loved that first season, and I can't wait for the second season to come out in 2020. I think my two favorite shows of 2019 were The Boys and Watchmen. Mm. Watchmen's my favorite by far, but The Boys is definitely up there. I need to see it. Were you a fan of the comic book series? I was. Then you'll definitely like it. I didn't like the comic book series, and I love the show. Okay. That seems to be a big consensus. Non-fans of the comic and fans of the comic both love the TV show. In my movie recommendation, I was trying to think of cool science fiction crime movies, and my favorite science fiction crime movie is Looper. Have you ever oh, seen that? Oh, okay. That's with yeah. uh, with uh, Darth Vader, right? Darth Vader. Isn't uh, Hayden Christensen in that? No, 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 no. no. That's, oh. uh, that's Jumper. Well, Looper and I, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis. Oh, 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 that's where he has to go back in yeah, time to face I himself. Okay. No, I, I haven't seen this. All right, Jess. I told you last time to watch Drive. Watch Drive and Looper. These are both excellent. I love – this is my favorite science – one of my favorite science fiction movies of all time. And so let me kind of give you the backstory to this. It's directed by Ryan Johnson. Before oh. he was hated for Last Jedi by a lot of people. Not and, me. I like Last Jedi. Please don't give us any hate in the comments. 
that I liked last Jedi too. Talked about to death at this point. Yeah, I think this is by far his best movie, and I'm saying that as a fan of the Last Jedi and his most recent movie, Knives Out, which I really enjoyed. Mm. So this movie has a really complex plot, so I'll try to break it down to the best I can. This movie mostly takes place in 2044, where time travel has been invented, but it's also been outlawed. So criminal organizations are using time travel to send back their victims in time for hitmen to kill and dispose of the bodies. Because in the future, it's nearly impossible to kill someone and hide the body and get rid of it. Just because of the oversight of the government and security. So they send these people back in time to be killed by loopers. These are the, these hitmen who kill these time travel victims. And eventually a looper's last victim will be their future selves to close the loop, to make sure that they can't talk, to make sure that they can't tell people what they're doing. Oh, and that's known? Yeah. So eventually every single person has a, some kind of currency. It's like silver on their back. That, that's, their, that's their payday. And if you find gold on their back, that's you in the future. You just killed your future self. And you don't know it until you take the bag off their face and you see your future self. And so you only have a certain number of years to enjoy your final payday and enjoy retirement. Before you get sent back in right. time. Before you get sent back in time. And so Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he, he botches the hit of his future self, which is Bruce Willis. And he has to track himself down and kill himself. This future Bruce self. Willis is on the run. Right. So Bruce Willis is on the run. It's such a good – it's it's so hard to explain the plot. You just have to watch it, Jess. No, you explained it all right. I get it. Good. And yeah. this is a 10 out of 10 for me. The only downside is that they put makeup on Joseph Gordon-Levitt to make him look like a younger Bruce Willis. And it doesn't always work. It, it kind of, it's kind of distracting sometimes. Okay. And that's the only complaint I have about the entire movie. And Emily Blunt's in it. She's also fantastic in it. So it's a solid cast. Emily Blunt, okay. You might like Looper even more than Drive, so I would say watch Looper first. Did you ever see, um, since we're talking about science fiction, what's the Tom Cruise movie? Is it Edge of Tomorrow? Now that's confusing because it came out as Edge of Tomorrow, and then on the Blu-ray they called it Live, Die, Repeat. But yeah, that is Edge of Tomorrow with him and Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt's in that, okay. Yeah, I, I like the movie good. so much that I actually buy, I don't buy physical copies of movies ever there's only like a few like big lebowski and napoleon dynamite yeah but i bought edge of tomorrow i loved it so much i liked edge of tomorrow but i like this a lot more in my okay. personal opinion okay so i would I definitely recommend watch, you to watch that soon okay i have to watch the final episode of watchmen first though yes i do and i'm going to do that as soon as we're done with this okay then you have to text me immediately after to tell me what you thought i will all right, so we're going to close out this video with our music recommendations of what yeah. we listen to as we read these books. Right. We to tell you, I think crime is really connected to music, and we love to tell you what music you should listen to as you read these books. So for me, for The Punisher, I listen to The Punisher scores from the TV show. Oh, which was composed idea. by Tyler Bates, who, not Tyler Blunt, Tyler Bates, who <laughs> did Guardians of the Galaxy and the John Wick franchise. And so he's a solid composer, and it really gets you in that Punisher mindset. And for Incognito, I have a jazz album. So, Jess, you're not going to be interested in this, but the rest of you should. And Psycho Cleveland, I guess, will be, because apparently he's a big jazz fan. Mm. I follow Greg Rucka on Instagram, and he's a huge jazz fan. And he's constantly posting new albums that he bought, so I always listen to what he recommends. And he recommended an album called Introducing Johnny Griffin, which is the first album of a famous saxophonist named Johnny Griffin. And I loved it. It was such a great album. It was an impressive debut album and it really paired well with incognito. So I listen to all these things on Spotify. I don't have a record player like Jess. You can find all of my recommendations on Spotify. Um, I'm far more likely to listen to a jazz recommendation than I am to read a manga recommendation. That's good to know. Yeah, your priorities are in the right place, Jess. I, I don't dislike jazz. It's just not my first choice of something to listen to. I, I totally understand. I didn't get jazz for a long time until I really threw myself into it. I, I, I can get why people aren't super into it, but I think you're. I once you go to a live jazz show, I think you get yeah. it. I think I've gone to so many live jazz shows now that you just I, I just really have that desire to constantly listen to it while I read books. It's just really. I don't know, it engrosses me a lot. So maybe well, you went to a live awesome. show. That's a great date night with your wife, by the way. 
a live jazz show and like have dinner while you're watching it. My wife and I love doing that. Awesome. That is great. Anything that engrosses you that much, I think is great. Uh, you wouldn't, you, not only would you not like any of my recommendations, but people probably haven't even heard of these or the record label or the <laughs> genre. Um, these are post-rock. One of them's post-rock. One group is post-rock and the other is um, a little bit more um, kind of uh, ambient music. So I'll tackle the ambient music one. I listen to, I just like um, kind of ambient post-rock, no vocals to listen to while I listen to music. I'm sorry, while I read books, I don't, I don't want to have any um, vocals as a distraction. Okay. So I don't, I don't necessarily want to set a mood as you do, which I think is cool. I don't want to set a mood. I just want to have something on in the background that I can listen to um, and, and fill up the space so it's not just silence. Um, okay. Yeah, I like to pair what I'm listening to to what I'm reading. Yeah, you're like doing wine with food, which I think right. is cool. <laughs> I think that's really cool. I just like to fill up the space and not have it be silence. So. Um, these are three of the albums that I listened to while I was reading the two books. Um, this is uh, a guy named Lindstrom. Wait, let me highlight myself here so I can get a little bit better picture. Lindstrom, limited edition clear vinyl, and it was um, two long tracks on each side. So if you want to try him out on Spotify, I believe he has more than one work. Uh, his name is Lindstrom. I, he is European. Interesting. Or, I, think, I think he's German, um, but I'm not sure. Scandinavian, German. Um, he's a line through the O, so he's somewhere. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, it's kind of Scandinavian, I think. Um, uh, not positive, but it's really good ambient music. And then through a member on Bowie's Turntable, which is a subgroup of the um, Omnibus Collectors Comic Swapping Community and he, I believe he's French so I can't even pronounce his name it's L-A-N-N-I-G then it's Kerlock like Lannig Kerlock and, and I'm sure that's not how you, I'm so sorry I apologize to you I'm sure I'm not pronouncing your name correctly but he has amazing taste in uh, um music and he's always he'll always uh, show his turntable and what he's playing and then he'll drop a youtube link so you can listen to it and this is from a group these two are from a group called this will destroy you and the albums are new uh, new others part one and new others part two and this is post rock and post rock is a genre which is um instrumental there's generally not vocals on it um uh, some other groups are boards of canada and mogwai uh, those are some of the more famous ones who i'm sure you haven't heard of um it, it's driving guitar i would say it's driving guitar music with really driving drums behind it um uh if you actually if you go on spotify and pull up Mogwai, M-O-G-W-A-I, um, that'll give you a good representation of what post-rock is like. And that's what I like to listen to when I read. I'm really excited to see your collection in general in May when I visit. I'm really excited to see your vinyl collection. It sounds like it's very extensive. Yes, and perhaps by then I'll have it uh, better organized than it is now. We'll super glue the ones that were broken in half by Omar when he dropped them. <laughs> <laughs> Where the action figures that he messed with when those albums fell out of the case and nicked up all my action figures. And Jess will include our album recommendations in the description of the video as well. Yes. I'll text those. I'll text my recommendations. Okay, to good. Um, that's perfect. Thank you for joining us in our Crime Corner. I thought that was a good episode. I thought so yeah. too. Thank you for uh, watching. Thank you for. Um, all the people that want to leave comments, we always respond to comments. If you could, please give us a like. Uh, feel free to subscribe. 
Um, feel free to leave us your suggestions as to your favorite crime book that's regards superheroes uh, and your favorite music that you like to listen to. Yes. We're always uh, up for suggestions. Yeah, definitely. We, and we always respond to the comments, so please leave a comment. Yeah, we love the comments, so we're always interested in hearing what you have to say. So uh, on behalf of Taylor and myself, thank you for watching. Peace and love. Peace and love. See you guys.